Okay, keep your place there. And if you would flip over to 2 Kings chapter 9, if you would. So here we see the story of King Ahab. And we talked about him a few weeks ago. But we see the story of King Ahab, and he had a he had many vineyards, and he had a vineyard, but he wanted this vineyard. And it was uh, a vineyard that he didn't have. It was apparently closer to where he was at. Uh, it wasn't that he didn't have vineyards, but he just wanted this one. It was not his, but he wanted it anyway. And he went out and he um, talked with his wife and conspired. His wife conspired to have the owner of the vineyard killed. We see that um, Elijah you know, puts you know, the smackdown on Ahab here, and he tells, um, he tells Ahab what's going to happen to his family because of what he's, what he's done. And it's interesting because, you know, we see Ahab and basically he's being coveted, right? He's coveting another man's property. And I just want to show you um, tonight, this, this is the sermon that we're going to, the topic of the sermon tonight is going to be on covetousness. This is one of the six sins that you know, God takes so seriously that he tells us in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that, you know, people are to be put out of the church for these types of sins. And I want to show you tonight... Um, what it means to be covetous, why God takes it so seriously, and, you know, that it has serious consequences. If you look in 2 Kings chapter 9, I just want to show you something interesting about this story about Ahab. If you remember the story of Ahab, Jehu is anointed king, and his charge is to wipe out the house of Ahab. He's supposed to kill every male of Ahab. He's supposed to kill all of Ahab's family. If you look, at, look down at 2 Kings in chapter 9, and verse, go to verse number uh, 20. So here we have Joram and Ahaziah are together. And in verse number 20, the Bible says, And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. So there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, the story kind of goes like this. A few verses back, all these watchmen, there's this guy driving towards um, where Jer Joram is, and there's all these watchmen go out to meet him and find out what he's coming so fast. He drives like Jehu, it says. That means that, you know, I'm thinking it wasn't like, like this. I mean, I'm thinking Jehu had a reputation for being a warrior, and he was coming fast, and the Bible says, furiously. And people knew this man, and they knew that when he was out to do something, he meant business. And they can tell from a distance. And these watchmen come out. He sends watchmen out. And Jehu basically tells them, you know, you want to live, get, get, you're with me. You want to die, go back over there. So all the watchmen don't come back. So finally, Jer Joram and Ahaziah go out themselves. And we see, uh, that's just a, a side note. Uh, but in verse number 21, the Bible says, And Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Because all the watchmen were returning. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. So both kings are there now. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. So remember a few weeks ago when Joram, in a couple verses here, is going to pull his bow back with his full strength. He's going to shoot an arrow straight through. Uh, when Jehu is going to shoot that arrow straight through Joram, right between his shoulders, the Bible says, and it came out in his heart. It's interesting to note that he killed him on the property of Naboth's vineyard. Now, how many people think that's an accident? I mean, that is God sending a message about how he felt about what Ahab did to Naboth. And then the Bible says in, um, at the end, in verse number 26, it's, interest, it's interesting to see that it says, James says, surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. It's interesting to see that the Bible implies here that Naboth's sons were also killed in this covetous transaction, which would make sense because if someone dies or is stoned, you know, you would think that the sons would inherit the vineyard. So I'm sure Jezebel and Ahab had to take care of them as well. So that's what the Bible implies. But I just want to give you kind of an uh, intro that what the, the sin of covetousness is taken very seriously by the Lord. Now, I want to look at covetous tonight. I want to look at covetousness. And I want to look at it from three different levels. I want to look at it from a global level. I want to come down to a national level. And I want to look at it from a personal level and what it means for us. Okay, now covetousness. What does it mean to be covetous? The 
definition is this, the general definition. It's marked by an inordinate desire for wealth or possessions or for another's possessions. So you're, it's you desiring something, basically, that is not yours or that belongs to someone else. In, the, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, we see in the Ten Commandments, this is one of them. The Bible says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. To not covet other people's property. So, let's look at the problems that covetousness causes in the world first. Turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. The Bible tells us the answer for everything. The Bible tells us the answer of, of what causes wars in this world, unjust wars um, in particular. The Bible says in James chapter 4, and starting in verse 1, the Bible says, From whence come wars and fightings amongst you? Among you. Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Then the Bible says, Ye lust, meaning ye mean you desire and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, meaning people will kill to get things that they want. They cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Now turn to Luke 11, 21. So the Bible here is explaining to us. Well, don't turn there. I'll just read it. I'll just read it for you. In Luke 11, 21, the Bible distinguishes between self-defense and an unjust war out of lust. Okay? And in Luke 11, 21, the Bible says, When a strong man armed keepeth, keepeth his place, his goods are in peace. Now there's two words in there I want you to notice. When a strong man armed keepeth his house. His house. And then he says it again. His goods are in peace. So you have every right to defend yourself, your property, things like that in the Bible. What the Bible is telling us in James chapter 4 is where unjust wars, which are the vast majority of all wars that have taken place throughout history, is basically driven through the lust of men's hearts. It's men wanting things that other people have. It's really that simple. When you think about it, you think about all the, you know, you could you could read for years and years and years on geopolitics and all these different things, but really what it boils down to when man and nations go to war is one nation wants something that another nation doesn't want to give, so they fight and they kill to get those things. You know, it's ownership of land, it's influence of land, it's ownership and influence over resources that that land has, or those people in that land. That's the bottom line. Let me introduce you to somebody else. I know I've introduced you to a lot of people today. I want to introduce you to one person in this sermon tonight. And I'm going to introduce you to a man called Smedley Butler. He lived, Smedley Butler lived in the early 1900s. He was a United States Marine Corps general. He was the highest rank authorized at that time. And at the time of his death, he was the most decorated Marine in U.S. history. During his 34-year career as a Marine, he participated in military actions in the Philippines, China, and Central America, the Caribbean, and finally World War I. Butler later, later became an outspoken critic of the U.S. force and their consequences. He was highly decorated. He was, at, at the time of his death, the most highly decorated Marine in, in U.S. history. He won the Medal of Honor twice. So the man knew about war. He had been in several wars. He knew all about war. He wrote, he gave a speech after he retired. And the speech became so popular that he wrote it into a short book. And the book was called, his pages long, 90 pages long. The book is called War is a Racket. And if you've never read it, you should read it. It'll answer a lot of questions on why things are going on the way they are. But it's, it's actually, he's basically defining biblical concepts for us in this 90 page booklet. So basically, what is a racket? A racket is an illegal or dishonest scheme for obtaining money. A racket is what Jezebel did to get Naboth's vineyard. She ran a racket against him. She was racketeering, you could say. She came up with a scheme that was dishonest to gain possession of this man's property. And Smedley Butler wrote this book that says, War is a racket. I'm going to read you a quote from this book that summarizes the book itself. 
War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. You see, this man fought in so many wars, it was hard for him to not see what was actually happening. His solution, you know, it's the most interesting part of his booklet is he, he details the profits of several diff different industries during peacetime and then during wartime, like the steel industries and the, you know, what we would call the military industrial complex. The, the industries that make machines of war, that make weapons of war, things like this, where people retool factories to make weapons of war, and the profits go from you know, 10, 12 percent to 300, 400 percent during times of war. So he's saying that war is a racket that is pushed by people that want to make money. So his solution, he doesn't want to be a person that doesn't give solutions, so he gives three solutions to stop this racket. And it's very interesting how these solutions line up with the Bible. His first solution is this, make, make war unprofitable. Butler suggests that the means for war should be conscripted before those who would fight the war. It can be smashed effectively only by taking profit out of war. The only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted. So basically go to these factory owners and all the military industrial complex and say, hey, before we fight this war, you all are going to sign up to make the same pay that the soldier in the trench makes. He's like, that would stop war. That's number one. Number two, acts of war to be decided by those who fight it. He also suggests that a limited referendum to determine if the war is to be fought eligible to be vote to vote would be those who risk death on the battlefield. Number three, limitation of militaries to self-defense. That's pretty biblical right there. For the United States, Butler recommends that the Navy be limited by law to operating within 200 miles of the coastline and the Army restricted to the territorial limits of the country, ensuring that war, if fought, can never be one of aggression. Especially items one and three here are designed to quell the covetous desires of men deciding to go to war. If there's no money to be made, number one, that's number one, he, he said, if there's no money, and number three, if the rules don't allow for such types of wars, the desire is nullified, the covetousness is, is shut down. Now I don't know if he, he was Christian, I, I don't know, but you know, these are biblical concepts to keep wars to defensive wars, to just wars, and to not you know, have people just go to war to lust after somebody else's property. Okay? Now the examples in my lifetime, you know, in the last 20 or 25 years, it, it's all just covetousness is all it is. I can't think of a just war in my life. And I could argue that I can't think of a just war in the last 150 years, but that would be more of a debate. I don't want to get into politics, but it's very easy to see that the area of the Middle East, for example, is an area that is vital to many different nations' economies. And right or wrong, I don't want to see the economy in the United States crash, and I don't want to see people in the United States suffer, but if we have to go and destroy a country every 20 years just so we can keep things going the way they're going here, that's not biblical at all, okay? It's covetous, covetousness. You know, the drone bombings that just happened a few days ago in Saudi Arabia is going to be a great example of this. That area of the world and what happens with those resources in that area of the world is extremely vital to the economy here, the economy in Russia, the economy in China, the economy in India, the economies all over the world. And there's all these interests that have interest there. There is no threat to us. There, there is not Al-Qaeda, the terrorists, as they get us all worked up, are not going to take over the United States, right? My high school wrestling team is better armed than most of Al-Qaeda probably ever was. I mean, you know, a, a group of people with 300 1984 Toyotas is not going to take over the United States. So they get you in these fear-mongering, um, you know, attitudes on the news channels and all these different things, and it's really just covetousness. We've got a racket going here. We need to keep things going. We need to keep control of certain resources in certain places, and that's what it all boils down to.
unfortunately. It's, it's not biblical at all. You know, we need to learn our, to use our own resources. Turn to Matthew um, chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, let me just say this. The military-industrial complex that you've always heard, this is also not a conspiracy. Or not a false conspiracy, anyway. It may be a conspiracy, but it's real. The only industry that I have seen in my 20-year career that never stops hiring is military industrial companies. They're always hiring. Always. They're always looking for engineers, technicians, technical people of all kinds. It's big business, folks. It's big business. And a lot of people work there, and a lot of people make a lot of money working there. In Matthew 24, in verse 6, the Bible reads, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So folks, what, what the Bible's telling us here is that this whole issue is just going to keep going and keep getting worse. So let's not be surprised, let's not be offended, but let's just know that it's driven by covetousness. It's driven by covetousness. Now, if we look at the next, gen the next level and we come down to the national level, you know, if we look at covetousness at a, at a level of a nation, we talked about it this morning. We're looking at things like political um, ideas like socialism. Socialism is driven and fed by covetousness. It's somebody coveting something that somebody else worked for. It's that simple. Under 30, you saw it this morning, under 30 in this, in this country, if you take a poll of people under the age of 30, 51% of them will have a positive view of socialism. It makes perfect sense if you don't have a biblical what? If you don't have a biblical worldview, it makes perfect sense. You know, someone who has no job, who's living in their parents' basement, who has piled up student loan debt and has no prospects, you know, when you tell them that you're just going to give them all these free things, that sounds pretty good to that person. It's, it's interesting, but, you know, it's not, it's not good. It's, it's also a nice, interesting fact that there's never been any more people in this country under the age of 30 living with their parents, living at home. So I believe that we've kind of reached this hump already in this country, maybe 15, 20 years ago with the baby boomers, and it's, it's harder and harder to make a living now. Um, I believe that a dollar goes less, uh, goes, goes, uh, doesn't go as far as it used to, obviously. Um, we've passed that hump. So now you get this generation of kids, you know, these 51% these of kids that want something that somebody else has. That's covetousness, the Bible says. You know, we saw this morning, if you have a different worldview than the Bible, it, it all just makes perfect sense. In, in 2 Thessalonians 3, in verse 10, the Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's the Bible's worldview of it. So it's not a socialist worldview at all. But look, you're not going to get elected with that campaign slogan. It's just not going to work. So even, it doesn't matter, Republicans, Democrats, they're all the same. They're all preaching the same thing. It's, it's two wings on the same bird. That's what it is. And the sooner you figure that out, um, the better off you'll be. Now look, you say, well, what's wrong with, you know, supporting, you know, half the country? The, what you need to understand is that it's dangerous. I told you this morning, communism is dangerous. The government is force. That's the problem. You know, Naboth didn't want to give up his vineyard. He was forced to give it up. They killed him for his vineyard. That's what the government will do. Stop paying your taxes if you don't believe me. See what happens. Don't pay your taxes. You know, if you're taking something and you're getting checks from the government, that money has been taken by force, essentially from the barrel of a gun from somebody else. Because if you stop paying your taxes, they will put you in jail, and if you won't go, they will, they will literally kill you. That has happened in this country in the not-so-recent past. That's why communists killed 100 million people in the last 100 years. Okay, do an experiment. If you don't believe me, do an experiment. Go to a, a nice neighborhood in Fresno, go knock on somebody's door, and go and bring them down to somebody that's living in a tent under, under a bridge, and say, hey, here's what we're gonna do guy in the house, we're going to sell your house and we're going to give half to you and we're going to give half to the guy in the tent. Let me know how many takers you get. You're not going to get any takers. Then what if you say, how about if we kill you if you don't do it? Then, then it, you might have more success. 
if you do that. But that's how it works. The government is force. Socialism is covetousness. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. Covetousness is the roots of socialism. Now, on the personal level, this is what it, it leads to. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. The Bible teaches us where we are supposed to get our possessions. You know, this guy had a palace. The guy that we just read about had a palace and he had goods in his palace. You know, he got those from somewhere, right? And it's not, it, it didn't say that it was wrong to have those things. But let's look at a personal level and then we'll come back to that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I'm going to first read for you 1 Kings 3. We're going to read about Solomon a little bit here. And Solomon is a really interesting case. And it's, it's kind of a sad story when you look at the whole picture of Solomon's life. But there's so many things you can learn from the life of Solomon. If you look at 1 Kings, you, you stay in Ecclesiastes 2. I'm going to read for you 1 Kings chapter 3. And I'm going to show you how Solomon um, started out. And I don't want to read the whole thing here. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I will give thee. Solomon has just taken over the, the kingdom from his father David after he died. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept him in, the, in this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne. Me, he's saying, as it is this day. And now... Now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I now know how, I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people. Thou cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? So basically, God comes to Solomon and he says, and, and Solomon's a young man. He's a young child, probably under the age of 20. And he says, what do you want? And Solomon has the, the, the humbleness to say, you know what? Give me a discerning heart to judge this great people. You know, he shows respect to his father. He shows respect to God. And he says, just give me a discerning heart. And then God, God basically, I won't read the whole thing, but God basically says, because you asked for that, I will give you that discerning heart. And I will make you wiser than any other man. And I will also make you richer than anybody else. So God gave him everything, right? And if we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Now look, you know, covetousness. Here's the, the, the rub of covetousness. If you get really covetous and you become covetous, it will never make you happy. It can't. It can't make you happy. I used to drive an hour and a half north of Sacramento to work. And I was on this two-lane highway for like an hour, and it was just stacked, lined up with cars the whole way. And there was always this guy that was trying to zip out in traffic and get one car ahead, one car ahead, one car ahead. And I'm just like, man, you're risking everybody's life to get two seconds ahead. There is no front of this line, is what I thought, right? There's no front. You know, that's, that's kind of like how if you live a covetous life, it will be. You will just get more miserable and more miserable and more miserable. The Bible says, he that loveth silver will not be satisfied by silver. I mean, it's, it, God puts that curse on it. If you get covetous and that's what you live for, it's called, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, right? I mean, my first experience with keeping up with the Joneses is when my wife and I first moved to Texas, and we just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was all these people that they would buy, and in Texas, housing is very cheap. You could buy a nice big house for not a lot of money, especially to California people. And we would see these people, you know, that I worked with move into these big houses. And the first thing they talked about was, yeah, but we really want to be in this neighborhood. These people would go and they would live in their nice big house and they would go look at houses on the weekends. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But they weren't happy where they were at. And we bought, you know, we bought a house that was about half the size of everybody else. And they're like, why didn't you buy a, a bigger house? Because we wanted my wife to stay home with our kids, which we did not have yet, but we were planning for that. But you, it'll never make you happy. That's the irony of it. Let's look at Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Because Solomon is a great example for us because Solomon did get to the front of the line. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and let's start in verse 4. 
And Solomon says, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith with the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and I had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than any that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. He increased more than any that were... He got to the front. He got to the front. Now skip down to verse number 17 and see what that did for him. And in verse number 17, Solomon says, Therefore, I hated life. He got to the front. He got everything he ever wanted and he was miserable for it. So it's ironic that if that's what you push for, you'll never be happy. You will never find joy there, ever. And as a matter of fact, if you read Solomon's words and you listen to the example of Solomon's life, it made him miserable. It didn't say, I was unhappy. He said, I hated life. I hated, I mean, that's a strong statement to say that you have this one life on this earth and you hate it. That's strong to say it that way. Now look, how do you find joy? How do you find joy in this life if it's not cars and wanting things and all this. What is it? Turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a, verse, is a verse in the Bible or a chapter in the Bible that was almost ruined for me as a Lutheran because it was one of the, the things that we chanted in, in the services and things like that. But once you know what it actually means, it's absolutely beautiful. In the middle of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms. Let me get there myself. In Psalm 51, let's look at verse number 12. So here you have David, who has just, he has just been found to be in sin. His son has just died. He just committed adultery with Bathsheba because he coveted some other man's wife, by the way. And he's, he's reconciling with God. God, you know, slayed his youngest son. His son died. David asked for his son not to die. The answer was no. And instead of, you know, getting mad at God and having a miserable life, what does David do? This, is, this psalm is one of the windows into David's heart, I believe, by the way. You say, you know, David, he made some stupid mistakes in his life. But the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. I believe that this is one of those windows where we can actually see David's heart. And you think about all the things that he just went through, the chastisement from God that he just endured. And how does he react? In verse number 12, David says, Let's go to verse 10. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He says, Renew a right spirit within me, God. Do you think that that's a prayer that God would answer? I would think that if you prayed that prayer, that God would answer that prayer just about every time, if you meant it. Verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then in verse number 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now that's, that's a great statement right there. Restore unto me the joy of thou, thy salvation. He never thought he lost his salvation. He just said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He had been through so, so many hard things and so many horrible things in the, last, the, in the recent past. He said, Restore unto me the joy. Now think about the joy of your salvation. How could you ever be in a bad mood or upset or down in your life? And I know you will be, and I, I will be, and, you know, we will all have low points in our life. But really, when you look at the context of your salvation, that's a good prayer. God, re, you know, I'm down in the dumps. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And then, verse number 13, it gets even better. Because then he says, when I have that joy back, what's he going to do? Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. He's going soul winning. Isn't that awesome? Give me my joy back, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to get people saved. That's what he said. And that's going to make him even more joyful. 
And you know what? You know what helps you when you're down in the dumps, by the way? Go help somebody else. About six weeks ago, we were half, I mean, we were somewhere in the middle of this move, and some catastrophic thing happened. It wasn't catastrophic. But at that time, it seemed like it was catastrophic. It was like all these things are going wrong. It was a Friday night, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why these things are happening, and I don't know why this happened. I don't know why. I had a friend whose sewer line, he was digging it up on his house. He just bought a new house in his sewer. He had, nobody could take a shower for a week. Have a, have a family, you know, of six people, seven people with no running water. Let me know how things are going for you. And he's digging this sewer line up, and I'm just like, everything's falling apart, and I'm going, like, I'm going to help Jose dig up his sewer line. That's what I did. You know what? It was selfish for me to do it, and it worked. Because I went and I helped this guy. I'm sitting here, every swing of the pickaxe, I just felt better and better and better. So go help somebody. Go help somebody out. You know, when you're depressed and you're down in the dumps and you have no joy, I know I'm kind of getting off topic here, but you have no joy, it's really because you're pointing things too much in your own direction. It's selfish. It's selfish. Get your joy back. Ask God to restore, because guess what you have joy for? Guess what you should have joy for, no matter where you're at in your life? The joy of your salvation, because you deserve to burn in hell. Right? I mean, that's a terrible thought. We go out and we try to explain hell to people every single week. We have to get them to understand hell to get saved. Period. Maybe we should think about those words ourselves and be like, hey, that could have been me. Now it doesn't matter what's happening with my air conditioning or my job or anything because I have the joy of my salvation. And then I can get out there and I can share that with other people. Right? Because when you have no joy, you're not going to want to share it with anybody when your joy is just gone. So that's where your joy comes from. Your joy doesn't come from wanting other things that people have that aren't yours. Okay? Now, don't lust after things that other people have. Right? That's covetousness on a personal level. We're not to lust after things that aren't ours. But there's a flip side here. Okay? In Psalm 128. No, you guys turn to Ecclesiastes 5. I'll read for you Psalm 128. Ecclesiastes 5, just a couple pages over from where you're at. Psalm 128, the Bible reads this. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy that shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Now look at Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 18. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God hath given him, for it is his portion. It belongs to you. The things that you get from your labor, that's your portion. It's, that's his palace. That's his goods. That's where he got it, from his labor. And then in verse 19, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. It's a gift that God provides for us on this earth, in this life, for us, to enjoy the fruits of our labor. So there's nothing wrong with working hard and buying a nice car for your wife, or working hard and finding a, a good place to live for your family, if you work for those things. So this is the... the the, the biblical teaching. And in 1 Timothy 6, verses 9, we, we see that it's a slippery slope, though. That's the problem. And especially in the United States of America, it's a really slippery slope. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 9, the Bible says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So there's nothing wrong. We see in Ecclesiastes 5, there's nothing wrong with working hard and enjoying the fruits of your labor. Nothing at all. But when it goes too far and your desire becomes to become rich and you can't ever get enough, that's when that lust for those riches is going to be a snare to you and it will eventually turn into covetousness. Will you be wanting things that are not yours? And then you're at that point where you're never going to be happy, where you will never be able to enjoy your life. It's, it's the example I gave you of those people that were living in those beautiful houses. I think of those houses today, and I'm like, I will never live in a house like that. That's completely fine. 
I will never, but they weren't even happy living in that house. Imagine that, right? These mansions these people were living in. You know, and the irony of those people, just, just the irony of it all, not only will it never make them happy, but they're running in this group of people. They're all the same type of people. They're all trying to impress each other, but they all really hate each other anyway, right? When one of them buys a house in a certain neighborhood, all the other people in that group were like, when are we going to be able to live in a better neighborhood than that, right? They're just coveting and coveting and coveting. These, they, there's no joy even in friendships in that type of situation. So look, work hard, fulfill your bil biblical duties, and enjoy your portion. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, the trouble is that it's, you know, always wanting more, wanting something for nothing. And, you know, if you didn't, you know, the bottom line is if you didn't work for it and it wasn't a gift, it's, it's not yours, is the bottom line. And you're being covetous if you want it. Now, turn to Matthew 22. So, why does God take this so seriously? Let's think about that for a minute. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 5, and verse 11, which is the, the core verse of this sermon series. And then I want to explain to you why covetousness is taken so seriously by God that it is put in this list of six sins that is not to be allowed in the church. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians 5, 11, the Bible says, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company if may any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or an extortioner, which such and one know not to eat. So in Matthew 22, I want to explain to you here why God takes this sin so seriously. In Matthew 22, look at verse 37. In verse 37, the Bible says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So remember that. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now turn to Luke 10. Turn to Luke 10. In Luke 10, in verse number 30, we see the parable of the Good Samaritan, as it's called. And let's just read it real quickly. We'll read verse 30 through verse 35. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, these were the, the outcasts in the north, right? They weren't even considered to be Jews anymore. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. So we are supposed to take care of people. We are supposed to, as Matthew 22 said, love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the opposite of coveting their possessions. That's why. And it's, is, it, is it a serious commandment? It's the second most important commandment. Because all the commandments can be broken into those two commandments. Love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself. That's it. It's the second greatest commandment. So when we covet something that our neighbor has, now who's our neighbor, right? Remember the pie of all the people in the world? We have our brothers and sisters that are here, which they're pretty much our neighbor too, right? We're supposed to love each other. We have all the unsaved people out there, and then we have this sliver of people that are rejected by God, they're reprobates, they're, they're false prophets, they're reprobates, they're unnatural, wicked people. We're not supposed to love them. They're the enemies of God. Amen. But our neighbor, everybody else, and even our personal enemies, but here it says our neighbor, we're supposed to love as ourselves. We're not supposed to covet anything of theirs. 
It's the opposite. So that's why it's so important. It's also very contagious, as a lot of sin is. And it leads to other sins. Now, I've not experienced this myself, and I haven't mentioned it yet tonight, but coveting your neighbor's wife is also part of that commandment. You know, coveting your neighbor's wife. Now, I've heard of this happening. I've never seen it happening where adultery happens in a church. And it, it causes havoc in the church. It could split churches. It's a terrible, terrible thing to even think about. So, let's have a culture moment. Remember, we're going to have these culture moments. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Right? I've never seen adultery happen in a church. But if we're going to abstain from all appearance of evil, and we're going to have a, a good culture here, you know, we should really be thinking about this, you know, this Bible talking about coveting someone else's wife. This means that if we're going to abstain from evil, this means that men, there is no reason for a man to be talking to someone else, some other man's wife. Amen. There's no reason. That's a culture that we need to have here. And I'm not saying that when somebody's wife walks by, you have to be like this and, you know, be all weird. But there's no reason for me to have a long conversation with somebody else's, with some woman that I am not married to. Now, I'm the, I'm the leader of, of this satellite church. There's going to be times when people want to talk to me. That's fine. If there's a woman that wants to talk to me and she doesn't want to talk to my wife and she needs to talk to me, my wife will be in the room and we, the three of us can talk together. There's no problem with that. Another good way of that to, that to work is if uh, a man and wife have, have an issue, if the man wants to come and talk with me, that's probably the best solution. But there's, there's no reason for men and women who are not married to each other and married to other people to be having conversations. It's a culture that we should have here. And you know what? I appreciate that culture. That's the culture that's at Verity in Sacramento, and I love it. Amen. Because nothing's more awkward for me than when I would be somewhere and somebody else's wife would want to come up or, you know, whatever you would see. I mean, it's just, it's weird. It's strange. It's strange. And it's just a culture that we should have to not, to abstain from the appearance of evil. So now, back to covetousness. You know, it's, it's sad that a lot of people fall into this, especially in the country that we live in. But if we go back to the global situation, folks, it's hardly Christian to covet the resources of other nations and, and cause you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of deaths because of it. It's not biblical. It's not something that the biblical worldview will teach you at all. It's hardly Christian at the na national level to covet other people's property or to ask the government by force to do so. That's not biblical at all. It's covetousness. You know, and finally, at the individual level, it violates the second greatest commandment. That, it's, it's really simple, right? It's not hard to understand. Look, work hard, enjoy the fruits of your labor, but, you know, don't work 90 hours a week just because you want more cars. That's not right. You're going to slide down that slope, and you're going to start getting miserable in your life. Things are going to you're going to have consequences with your family. You have an obligation, men, to your family. You know, it doesn't, I have met people that, that sacrifice their family because of work. And so it's a, it's a balance. We're commanded to support our families and to provide for our families, but we need to balance um, our other responsibilities that the Bible puts on us for that. Okay? So covetousness. It's a serious, serious sin. Um, I've never even, uh, you know, it's a serious sin that God doesn't want in the church. And like I said, you know, we're not on a hair trigger to kick people out of the church. This, this series was more of a uh, a reason to shine the light on these sins so we can shine the light on and, and help each other, okay? And help each other from a biblical point of view. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this church. Lord, we thank you for um, all the gifts that you've given us in our life. Lord, we, we ask that you just keep us all content. Lord, we ask that you um, just keep the covetous spirit of this country and, and people outside in the world just out of the hearts of, of the people in this church, Lord. We thank you um, for your word. Lord, we thank you for just the wonderful balance and just how much sense the Bible makes, Lord. Um, 
just thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. Bless, bless our week, Lord, and uh, bring us back on Thursday for church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.